In chapter six of our course, we will talk about speech acoustics. That is, we will learn how speech is produced by a human. In order to do so, we first have to talk about the anatomy of the human speech production system. And what you see in the background is actually a cross section of the upper human body, including all the organs which are responsible for the production of speech. Speech is an acoustic signal, so we first have to generate an airflow, and this is done through the lungs. Uh, the lungs, which you see here in the picture, they can be compressed by the musculation surrounding it. Like you can press on an air balloon, and then of course the air tries to evaporate. And there is only one possibility for evaporation, namely this tube here, which is called the trachea. The trachea is located close to another tube, which you use for eating and drinking. So in order to prevent this liquid from flowing into your lungs, there can, uh, this trachea can be closed at the upper end by the so-called larynx, which includes two vocal folds, um, which can be opened and closed. They are closed if you are drinking, but they are opened if you press on the lungs through the musculation, and then the air can evaporate through the vocal folds into two cavities. First is the oral cavity, which you see here, and the second one is the nasal cavity. The oral cavity can be shaped by the organs surrounding it, namely the lips, the teeth, the tongue, the palate, and the jaw. And then there is this little tip here, which is called the velum, uh, which can link the second cavity, the nasal cavity, to the first one as a kind of parallel structure. All this needs to be controlled, and the control unit is, of course, the human brain, which you see here. Now, the speech production process can then be summarized in two steps. The first is the generation of an airflow that is called an excitation signal through the lungs, which serve as an energy source. By pressing air through the trachea and through the glottis, which is the opening in the larynx, and then exhausting it through the oral and nasal cavity. And during this exhaustion process, uh, we modulate the airflow, that is, we press information onto the airflow, and this is called the shaping process. So the speech is produced in two steps, the production of the excitation signal and the shaping. Now we will first talk about the excitation signal, and there are actually different possibilities for generating such a signal. The first is, if the vocal folds are closed, then if you press through your musculation onto the lungs, uh, the air pressure below the vocal folds will rise uh, up to a certain point where the vocal folds suddenly get open and then the air can evaporate through the vocal folds. And of course the air pressure below the vocal folds will drop again and this drop in the air pressure will lead to a feedback force which is called the Bernoulli force which forces the vocal folds to close again. If they are closed then the air pressure below can rise up to a certain point, they are pressed open again, air can evaporate, uh, the feedback force will force them to close again, and so on. So we have a periodic opening and closing of the vocal folds. This happens with a fundamental frequency of speech production, and this fundamental frequency corresponds to approximately 100 to 125 hertz for men, and between 150 and 200 hertz, sometimes even higher for women, and it is even higher for children, especially young children. Um, mathematically, this opening and closing can be described by an impulse train that is a sharp opening and closing process which is repeated with a fundamental frequency. This is an ideal situation. In reality, we will have a more triangular shaped uh, excitation signal, which you see on the left panel in the picture behind me. Uh, there is uh, illustrated the uh, surface which you have of the area between the vocal folds, the glottal area, and also the velocity, both are triangular shaped. And on the right hand side you see the corresponding spectrum. The spectrum is a broadband spectrum, which however drops with the square of the frequency. Uh, we can try to measure the fundamental frequency by putting electrodes on both sides of the larynx. 
Uh, and the electrodes can then measure the resistance or the complex resistance or impedance between these two electrodes. Um, if the vocal folds are open, we will have a relatively high resistance because there's air, which is a good isolator in between. But if the vocal folds are closed, we have body mass in between, and that means that we have liquid like water, which is a relatively good conductor. Uh, we can measure this with a machine which is called the laryngograph, and you will see more illustrations on this laryngograph machine uh, in the material of this course. The periodic excitation is only one possibility. We have a second one, which is a non-periodic or aperiodic excitation. And then there are two further possibilities. First is if the vocal folds are open, then the air can evaporate. And through the shape of the oral cavity, this will lead to some turbulence of the airflow. This turbulence acts as a kind of noise generator and you can even feel where this happens when you produce the corresponding sounds. These are called the fricatives, for example, a f sound or a s sound, where you can really feel that it happens close to the tip of your lip, of your, of your um, tongue, uh, or a sh sound, where it happens a little bit further inside. This continuous uh, excitation signal corresponds so to a broadband noise, that is, it also contains many frequencies in it. The second way of producing a non-periodic signal is to use an explosive signal produced by opening the vocal cavity, the mouth, at a certain point. This happens, for example, for a B or P sound at the lips, or a D or a T sound, where you open, uh, open it uh, at a point behind your teeth or g or k sound, where you open it a little bit more inside your mouth cavity. This sudden opening produces a step-like function, which is also non-periodic, but it's only one instance where it happens. So in summary, we have two different possibilities for the excitation signal, either a periodic impulse strain-like signal, or a non-periodic signal, either a continuous one, which corresponds to a broadband noise, or an explosive one, which corresponds to a step function. All these excitation signals have many frequencies, which then can be shaped in order to put information onto this carrier signal. And this is done in the second step, namely the vocal shaping.